Thank you so much uh, for having me this evening. Uh, it's nice uh, to be here and to see familiar faces. Um, and I just have to say, it's very poignant to be back here on campus. I attended uh, GFS, spent a lot of time uh, in, this, uh, in this meeting house. Um, and this school uh, and this place was where so much of my early education and, and curiosity was cultivated. So a shout out to this place. Um, to get started, I'll introduce you to Pannone. I'm gonna situate him a little bit within the larger context of uh, the art world that he sort of grew up and came up in. Um, I'll review his early work from the 1960s and 70s, and then conclude with the way in which Pinone continues to play a significant role in the art world today. So my talk is about 40 minutes, and we'll have time for questions and comments, but I'll also say, if I say something that's crazy or doesn't make any sense, or please interrupt me along the way. I am happy to make this more of an exchange um, if you have questions. So, um, we'll begin. I have my handy dandy remote because I tend to walk around. I know I'm on film, so I'll try to <laughs> stay still too. Um, so Giuseppe Pinone, who you saw in the first slide, was born in uh, the town of Garesio which is where that red dot is, in the province of Cuneo, in the sort of Italian Riviera. Um, and as a young student, he attended the Accademia delle Belle Arti, the art school in Turin. Um, and that is where he currently lives and works. He has strong connections with Paris and has spent a lot of time teaching also in Paris, but his home base has really always been Turin. Now, Pinone was one of the youngest artists to be included in the Arte Povera movement, the poor art <coughs> movement, which in the 1960s and 70s circled around a group of artists. And these names may not entirely be familiar to all of us, but I'm going to rattle off some. Yanis Kunelis, Michelangelo Pistoletto, and this work is um, one by Pistoletto. It's one of his famous mirror paintings where he'll um, make a work on a piece of stainless steel or mirror that's reflective and then on it he will apply photographic images. This one here is of Pinone, so here he is in the tan jacket. Uh, other artists include Mario and Mirissa Mertz, Alighiero Boetti, uh, Giuliano, um, Giovanni Anselmo, Gilberto Zorio, I'm just saying that so I can sound really good in Italian, um, which I love to speak and I don't get to speak so much anymore. Um, but what held this group together was a way of sort of making work that directly engaged with the world, making artwork with everyday stuff, with their bodies, frankly addressing and meeting the images, the materials, and the issues of their time, really prioritizing process over product. Now, it was the famous art critic, this guy here, this imposing guy, is a very influential art critic named Germano Celant, who is from Genoa. He actually is one of the great tragic losses of the COVID pandemic in Italy. He died in 2020. But he was the one who coined the term arte povera. And he was the one who kind of saw a lot of diverse uh, artists working in Turin, in Rome, in Milan, in Florence. And he wrote an article in 1967 called Poor Art, Notes for a Guerrilla War. And that became sort of the group's manifesto. And as we know, great artworks and great art groups always have a manifesto, right? <laughs> and so Chillant was the central creator and promoter of this um, group of artists uh, throughout his life, organizing exhibitions, writing about the group, as sort of the premier contemporary art group coming out of post-war Italy. We really don't think about Italy so much as with contemporary art, and if we do, it really is this group from the 60s and the 70s. I'm not going to read tons of quotes from Chillant, but here's one that I think encapsulates a good idea of what Arte Povera does. Art, the arte povera artist does away with categorical propositions such as pop or op or primary structures to focus on gestures that do not add anything to our well-educated perception, that do not oppose themselves to life as art 
or lead the creation of separate levels for the ego and the world, but exist as social gestures in and of themselves. That is, the artwork is a social gesture, which I think is really interesting. So what I'm gonna do for a minute is scroll through some images to give you a sense of the work that we're talking about when we talk about poor art. This is one of the most famous works. It was Mapa Mondo, or a, um, a sphere um, uh, of newspaper, sort of paper mache, that was rolled through Turin in 1967. The uh, artwork was rolling the ball from one gallery to the next, and then it gets exhibited. This was actually done here in Philadelphia when there was a major exhibition of Pistoletto's work, also in Cold Springs in New York, where there's a really wonderful museum called Magadino, which gathers together a large group of Italian artwork. Um, it's a private collection in Cold Spring. So, um, but there's one. This uh, group was doing things that were sort of all over the place. This is Luciano Fabro, all his upside down Italy's in all different kinds of materials. Um, but it was um, about sort of the junk and the stuff of the world, everyday objects, and the work often showed you what it was about. So if it was about nature, it was gathering a bunch of horses and showing them in a gallery for three days in Rome. The horses were fine, uh, but they were the art product. Or if the work was about electricity and energy, they would bring frozen pipes and light into a gallery. Or, this is one of my favorites, a work about gravity. It's two pieces of granite that are um, held together and there's a piece, a head of lettuce in between. And when the lettuce sort of wilts and falls down, one block falls down, that's the gravity, that's the work, that's what it's all about. So it's about, the work is about itself. It's about <coughs> tension, it's about presence. Arte Povera artists made work that talked about humanism, that talked about conscious action. It was a shift to focus on humans rather than things. And this was one of the famous first exhibitions is a series of photographs from uh, the, one of the first Arte Povera exhibitions in 1968 and an excuse to hang out on the Amalfi Coast where they played soccer, they drew lines in the water, which you see up here. Um, and they created sort of bales of hay, and the artwork was all the artists sitting together and having a conversation, and everyone, especially the little kids, thought it was a little weird and wild, and they all sort of stood around and watched the artists make a work of art. So this was all very much part of a larger movement in the international art world, um, with pop, oh, this is, I'm sorry, this is Giuseppe Pannone, we'll get back to him, but this is one of his works from that period. Um, but here I'm showing you some famous pieces, Andy Warhol's Brillo Boxes, famous sort of um, pop piece, some um, Donald Judd works that sort of very much are about minimalism, um, some performance pieces. This is another Robert Smith sense where he dumped asphalt down uh, a cliff. Uh, and this is Alison Knowles, one of the major fluxus artists working with her famous piece, which is to make a salad and serve people salad, which I've been to. They're a lot of fun. She still performs them today. But anyway, Arte Povera was sort of in the mix and making artwork that was sort of sharing with their international colleagues a position um, against consumerism, against making products that could be bought and sold, but making works that were sort of about these bigger conceptual ideas. And you can see that Arte Povera was deeply entrenched in its time. Pistoletto's mirror painting depicting the anti-war protests, which you can see, um, draw viewers into and do not let them be passive participants. So this is a mirror, so if you stand in front of it, you are part of the exhibition. Or this is Mario Mertz's, he does a lot of these sort of igloo-shaped domes, and on it in neon, he has the Northern Vietnamese military philosophy if the enemy concentrates, he loses ground. If he scatters, he loses force. Or this top one by um, Emilio Prini, which was sort of a, a reaction against what was called the Miracolo Italiano, or the Italian miracle, which in the late 1950s was a huge economic boom in Italy. But he saw that rapid industrialization and modernization as something that was negative. And he made a work called um, Uza Uza, which is the United States uses. And the work was um, a machine recording the sound of itself working until it broke apart. So um, this is sort of the movement in which Pinone uh, grows up. Um, and so let's get to him. 
So Giuseppe Pannone was one of the youngest artists to be included in the movement, and Germano Cellan saw what he was doing and sort of saw the affinity and connection with his practice in Arte Povera. Pannone stands out specifically for his way of thinking sensitively, slowly, closely, instinctually, and intellectually about nature's processes as they are impacted by individual and collective action. The interweaving of human and natural forces in creative expression is at the heart of his work. And here he is in pure Arte Povera fashion, making artwork in 1969 by hugging a tree. So I came across this photo and the group of photos that um, it belongs to in a whole series of works when I was actually studying in Italy, in Bologna, for my junior year abroad. And I was just gobsmacked as sort of randomly uh, by this artist. And this whole series of works, and I'll go into, this is a lot of images, so don't worry if you can't sort of tell what we're looking at. I'll, I'll show you some highlights in a minute. But this whole project was called Maritime Alps, and it was Pannone's first post-university project. So he graduates from art school, and what do you do when you graduate from art school? You go home, maybe? Um, and sorry, mom. Uh, and um, he actually, though, started making work in the place that he knew the best, in uh, the town where his father and his grandfather had been farmers on the land, had been uh, woodworkers in the forest, and he starts going there and making work in that place. So he goes up to a tree, and he starts hugging the tree, and then he'll outline the tree with nails to sort of leave a trace of his body on the tree. <clears throat> is he doing sculpture or is he doing photography? I don't understand. That's a really, really great question. So he is doing sculpture, but it's not a kind of sculpture that goes anywhere because it's in the woods and those trees aren't getting cut down and then being sort of put into a gallery space. So the way in which they can be commodified is through photography. So he is documenting the works through photography and drawing, and then those are the things that then become what you have of the work. So that's a great question, and I think one of the complexities of this period is like, how do you, how do you make work if they are actions, if they are processes? Um, and this whole um, work is sort of that negation, and that there were a lot of artists in this period that were saying, we don't want to make things that can necessarily have a value and be monetized by someone else. So braiding three saplings together, making a box out of the shape of his body, a very Leonardo da Vinci, Vitruvian man kind of gesture, where man is the measure of all things. But he makes this concrete box and then diverts the flow of a stream uh, by the intervention of this box in the landscape. Grabbing um, the branch of a tree and then thinking about what would happen if his hand stayed there, and imagining in this drawing what would happen. All of these actions were part of Pannone's effort to engage directly with the things of the world, to prioritize experience, engagement, effort, to explore the phenomenological, right? What is the effect and the consequence of touch? To ask what is the artist's gesture? Is it the art, what is the art? Is it the artist's initial gesture of grabbing the tree or the reciprocal gesture of the tree branch? What is the process in making the work, the concept, the event, or the movements that happen over time as the trees grow and change, as the rings develop, as the shape of the tree moves around the initial or the original spot of encounter with the artist, who could not stay and hold the tree and so left a cast of his arm in its place, <laughs> standing in as the years passed and as his original gesture was made manifest, made into a living index of what had once been an ephemeral touch. In this case, we've been looking at various versions, and this is basically to answer your question, of a work called um, It Will Continue to Grow Except at That One Point from 1968. Pannone would periodically return to these installations to check on the process of his initial gesture. And so photographic documentation became an important way to know about the project, which has taken on iconic status over the decades. The initial gesture might have been Pannone's, but his encounter with the tree was a partnership. It was the growth of the tree. So it makes man and nature co-creators in a years-long effort 
that is hard to classify and even harder to commodify. And in fact, the two photographs, you can see the drawing that I've showed you already. We'll come back to this drawing many times because in many ways it is the core of his practice. But these photographs are then the things that get shown in the galleries. He has done this work over and over again. The original tree, the first time he did it, it no longer exists. That tree has been cut down. Um, but there are multiple hands on trees across the forest of Italy. You might have come across one if you're going on a hike. But he continues to kind of engage in this kind of process. So drawings are a part of the documentation of the gesture. It's a, his, pro, his whole art process is a constellation of parts. They can be the action, the photographic documentation, the drawing. As you can see, there's uh, annotation on this drawing. He's a prolific writer. And a lot of what he does is also writing down his thoughts almost in a stream of consciousness um, as he's working. Um, he shares his thoughts to kind of show us how he's thinking about the fluidity of the tree's growth and the shared breath that allows both the artist and the forest to co-create. For Pannone, here he is on a new version of the arm, so that sapling will then eventually grow, but here he is now. For Pannone, touch delivers knowledge. Many of his works, uh, and this was one of the main sort of investigations of my dissertation, show us that our tactile knowledge of the world is more straightforward and more truthful, is a more straightforward and a more truthful means of knowing. In writings and in interviews, Pannone says that touch is the kind of knowledge that comes before thought, before interpretation, and before language. He explains, and this is a quote, if I were to ask you what distance there is between you and, and the wall, you could only give me an approximate measurement. In order to understand the difference, you actually have to cover it physically. The same applies to materials. You see a shiny object. It could be a solid or it could be a liquid. In order to verify it, you have to touch it. This demonstrates that sight is deceptive. It's a convention. For Pannone, touch is the antidote to a total reliance on our visual understanding of our relation with the world. And I think this is really interesting now in a world that everything is so visual and so quick this artist, and I think why Pannone stands out for me is so important, is that he prioritizes touch and time. Now, I've introduced you to Pannone as sort of this artist, sculptor, conceptual artist, um, but he's also a profound and prolific um, creator of drawings. And I'm showing you here some of uh, the many drawings that were in an exhibition last year. I don't know if anyone went and saw Pannone had a major drawings exhibition at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. It opened around this time last year. Um, and many of the drawings that I'm going to be showing you tonight were on view at that exhibition. Um, and one of the reasons why Pannone decided to give this major gift of over 300 drawings from the 60s to the present to the Philadelphia Museum of Art is that he felt a very strong connection to the museum here in Philadelphia. On his, oh, actually. On his uh, gift, he said, a museum is a place intended to collect and display works of art. Some museums only, not only perform this function, but are in themselves unique and special places. The Philadelphia Museum of Art is one of those places. Now, no place is devoid of spirit, and the uniqueness of the Philadelphia Museum of Art is the presence within its walls of the work Etant Donné by Marcel Duchamp been to the Museum of Art, you know this is one of the wildest works in the whole museum. Um, it is a work, Pannone says, that has always seduced me for its mystery and its timelessness. It gives me a sense of familiarity with the museum that hosts it. Gifting a part of my work to this museum is also to establish an ideal dialogue with the splendid works in its collection. So, this is a really important thing. He gave his work to, to the Philadelphia Museum of Art mostly because of the Duchamp collection that's there. And as we know, Marcel Duchamp spent years in Philadelphia determined to create in our museum space a repository for his most important works. Early paintings, the ready-mades like bottle rack and the urinal, the large glass, which for art historians is sort of the seminal work of the 20th century. This talk is not about Duchamp, but I'd be happy to talk about him with anybody at another time. Um, Duchamp's efforts to kind of create this central place for so many of his works has served as a kind of homing beacon. P 
Canone's large drawing gift is here in part because of the way it will interact with Duchamp. So I, I thought that was really interesting. And um, it, was, uh, it was really great to see. I, I, I saw Canone when he was here for the opening of the exhibition. And he was just like a kid in a candy shop. He loves walking through our museum and thinks that it is just one of the most special museums in the world. So it's nice to kind of have that connection. OK. So back to Canone. Um, I showed this and I realized I don't have a detail. My dad got up and was looking at it. So I'll explain to you what we're looking at. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about drawings before we get back to sculpture. Because scholars point out that the great majority of Pannone's drawings uh, are investigations of texture. Not necessarily for texture's sake, but as another way to study reality by transcribing directly from a surface. So one example of that process is this uh, delicious investigation of textures, which is called, ironically, scultura, or sculpture. And it's from 1974. And it's a grid of images. And closer inspection reveals that we're looking at a grid of 48 palm prints. So he covered his palm with graphite powder. He then took his powder-covered palm and took a piece of tape and captured sort of the imprint of his hand with the powder and then put that tape onto a piece of paper to get this imprint. So it's a direct copy of the surface of the skin. It's a drawing, but not really. It's more like a creative photocopy, registering touch. Pinone has done many works, uh, like Scultura, which begins with the idea of touch as an automatic image. His basic idea is that touching other things in the world creates images, fingerprints, whether we intend them or not. Scultura, this work, attempts to register that kind of contact with the world. And we leave, all of us, little drawings everywhere, right? Every time we touch a door, every time we pull a chair out, we're leaving little marks, little drawings, little sculptures of ourselves around the world. It's kind of a really lovely thought. Pinone has frequently referred to his work as tautological, and that's just big art historical term that sometimes we use to say we're using the thing to show the thing itself. So he presses his charcoal dusted body onto tape or paper to show skin. Uh, unfolded, exposed, it's a way to be completely open and revealing of the self. In a way, it is the artist modeling to the world how to be both vulnerable and open and honest. And here's another version where he's kind of photographing his entire head from all angles and all perspectives by pressing onto a plate, like almost like um, when a chemist uses like little glass plates. Excuse me, I'm gonna get a sip of water. And then photographing sort of the place where his body is touching. So he's getting the totality. And this is where I think that artists are the best interpreters of our world because they understand how to maneuver all different kinds of perspectives and to show us all different points of view all at once. But that's just why I became an art historian. Another brilliant series is um, called Propagation. And from afar, you might say, it's a wall. It's got something on it. Is it lines? I don't know. It sort of looks like a circle. Walk a little closer. Are there individual lines? I still can't tell. You walk a little closer, and you'll see that the drawing on the gallery is an extension of a series of circular forms that come from a spot in the middle of a piece of paper that's tacked up on the gallery wall. You move a little closer, and you can see, and here again are Pannoni's words, the starting point for propagation is the imprint of a fingertip, covered in typographic ink, embossed at the center of a sheet of paper. It's an imprint of a particularly sensitive portion of skin which, with which we gain tactile experience. But the fingerprint is also a unique and original fact, different in each individual, an element that allows for identification. And here you can see the process. So there's the touching. And then here's Pinone on a ladder as he continues the lines that come out from, the, uh, from that fingertip. Um, <clears throat> so, um, the act of drawing sets in motion the propagation of the imprint of his fingertips. Using India ink, Pinone connects the lines of his fingertip with a concentric layout of circular shape that gradually, gradually, gradually grows larger. 
the concentric circles of the fingertip skin sort of look like, I think, the concentric circles that mark a year of the tree's growth on a sort of cross-section when you cut a tree and you can see its years of growth. We then come back to the works at the beginning, observing the growth of the tree and now connecting it with the shape of our own skin. And this is the way with Pinones Uga, the constant return to themes that allow us to follow it chronologically or to spiral away from it. So in the late 1960s, Pannone observed in this work um, that the growth of the tree is like uh, water. It's fluid, but it's a slow fluidity. It's not visible to the human eye, except with the passage of scores of years. But the expansion of the tree is a flowing outward, not unlike the shape created by casting a pebble onto the surface of the water and watching the ripples expand in concentric circles from that point of contact. And the shape of our fingerprint, too, can become like the shape of expanding ripples, underscoring a main contention of the artist that being human is being nature. So this is an installation, and Pannone does lots of installation practices. This is a more recent work from around 2007, um, but they show the interconnectivity of his work. This is called water drawing. And <clears throat> in this case, Pannone draws a fingertip in the water rippling the surface of a basin thanks to a uh, temporized airflow that comes up from the bottom. So there's this em emission of air that with the cadence of a breath allows for the drawing of a fingertip to come up onto the surface of the water and then gradually disappear. This was in the gardens of the Reggia di Veneria in Italy. And then we return again to the late 1960s because a common origin of the propagation work can be found in a series of ink drawings from 1969. And here's an example from the Philadelphia Museum of Arts exhibition last year called The Fallen Forest Reveals a Circle of Imprints. In which, so we have a fingertip that sort of becomes the cross section of the tree as it's fallen down. And then sort of the ink that gets pressed up along the paper um, so you get sort of that sense of the gesture of the artist, but also a sense of fallen trees in the forest. Um, Pannone notates on these drawings, which imply a strong connection between the fingertip and the growth rings of the tree, that our touch extends outward into the world, not unlike the growth of the tree expands outward and upward towards the light. So, getting back to sculpture. How am I doing on time? Okay. Um, all right. Um, so. I go on tangents. If you're ever in one of my classes, I'm sorry. So I'll try to get back to get us finished on time. Um, so here's one of Pannone's most classic sculptural practices. It's called alberi, or trees. It's a perpetual theme and subject of the artist's work that began in around 1970. Um, and here's how the artist described the work. To recover the form of the tree inside the mass of wood is an action of sculpture. The idea came after I worked with the growth of trees by modifying their forms through my action. I then transformed this idea to blocks of wood, thinking that I could recover the form of the tree inside the wood. I used industrial beams. The idea was to discover the lost characteristics inside a material and form. Wood equals material, wood equals forest. I wanted to find forest inside the material wood. So you can see there's the beam, and then he's found the tree inside. Pannone started, and this is a photographic series in which you can see he went to the lumber yard and just bought a block of wood. He buys them very carefully, finding, making sure that he can see the knots and sort of the sources of the branches. And then little by little, he starts in carving, carving, carving until he's got sort of a mark of the sapling. Um, and he would do this on view, so that it was sort of a process and an action, and you could go see him in the gallery space. This was in 1970 when he was carving. Um, so I think it's really such a fun idea of sort of excavating into something that's already sort of been taken from one original form to another and then brought back to its original form. Um, so Pannone wanted to show the fact of the, of the tree as it already existed within the milled beam. He wanted not so much to make a work of art, but show the medium of sculpture, or to use sculpture to show what a tree does, how it grows, how it expands through time, using the tree to show us facts about the tree itself. So when they were originally made, they were sort of exhibited lying down. So you would see sort of the flat, uncarved portion of the beam itself. 
the industrial form of lumber, wasn't discarded in the process of making the tree. Both are present, sort of the natural and the industrial form. And Pannone talks about the necessity of keeping part of the man-made beam. If he carved the sapling completely from the tree, which he could do, he's a really, really good carver, um, he talks about how um, if he carved it, he would have just made a branch. But by leaving the sort of industrial part, he's revealing and keeping a hold on the imperfect artistry, sort of the demonstrative act of what he's done. And here is a drawing, again, this was in the exhibition at the Museum of Art, where you can see sort of the way that he's made drawings of the stacks of beams, and the way he kind of looks for the core, looks for the rings, and then finds like the right beam. He does a lot of work. He doesn't just sort of pick any industrial beam that he finds. Um, there's sort of the talent in seeing which beam will be the right kind. And then just for fun, I'm showing you some of the subsequent trees, which turned vertical, and the milled beam became the geometric base. These are just so much fun um, to look at. And I think also, um, as an art historian, I can't help but think that he is drawing on somebody like Brancusi and thinking about that sense of the sculpture and the pedestal sort of becoming one, which was one of Brancusi's sort of major contributions to this idea of like separating art from the thing itself. Um, and so this work is one of the um, sculptures in the Philadelphia Museum of Art Connections, collections, so another connection with Pinone in Philadelphia. Um, this is one of the sort of most significant uh, alberi that Pinone did. It's called Cedro di Versailles, or Versailles Cedar, from 2000 to 2003. And it was carved from a 194-year-old cedar tree from the park at Versailles. I don't know if you remember, in 1999, there was a huge storm that hit Versailles, and tons of trees fell down. It was sort of a disastrous storm. And one of the ways in which they recovered from that storm was an auction to raise money, and Pinone actually purchased two of the trees um, from that auction to create these works, because these sort of old legacy trees are very difficult. It's not easy to come by them, come by them and to work with such historic wood. Um, so this was a, a sort of a chance in a million that he would have access to this scale of a tree. And I love this picture of him inside the tree, sort of investigating and sort of, um, it's almost like a, an archeologist finding the tree inside. Um, so um, when you'll see Pinone's trees, I think I'll show you some of his um, more recent trees. He's actually turned to casting them in bronze and in steel and in aluminum um, so that he can make these sort of grand sculptures, but he doesn't really use wood because it's almost impossible to get trees this size. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so we saw the inner life of trees, now we're gonna see the inner life of uh, the artist's site. One of the last uh, chapters of my dissertation focused on perhaps Pannone's best known work of this era, uh, to reverse one's eyes. And the work began with the artist asking an optician to make a pair of mirrored contact lenses. The technology at the time in 1970 was kind of not what it is now, so the optician had to make um, two pairs of lenses, one mirrored and then another one to sort of cover the first. And then Pannone put those mirrored contact lenses in his eyes and they were very thick. So they were very painful to wear. This wasn't just sort of, I don't really think that um, this was a comfortable artwork to make. But then he would put them in, insert them, and then he would wear them in gallery openings. So he was blind, I mean, in the sense that he couldn't see, but anyone who came up to him could sort of see what he would have seen if he had been not wearing them. Um, there are over 700 photographs from this series um, but the way that you typically see it are these six images, a title slide and then the five, that are actually shown in a gallery space. And I love it because it's shown on a projector with the slides themselves going through. And, you know, as an art historian who uh, was in classes in the dark with the ch-ch, it's just such a great sound, right? And it's missing from art classes these days. Um, and so you'll often see this work um, shown with a projector. Um, so, 
Um, so you'll go through and see these images, um, and this sort of, you see Pannone, and you get closer, and you get closer, and when you are in this image, you can see the photographer, you can see the landscape, you can see the horizon line. Um, to reverse one's eyes reveals vision to be a fully embodied action, one that we understand because we are seeing beings while we are also simultaneously being seen. Pannone presents spectators with the unconventional proposition that we understand sight not at a safe and detached distance, but as an intersubjective phenomenon. We're bound together by our visibility. I see you, you see me. And that's the only way that we can understand sight. He is sharing his vision with us. He is showing us what he would have seen if we were in his shoes. He is showing us that to understand the world, we have to give over our sight, give over our sense of individuality, and agree that what we see is always a give and take, always a shared proposition, and that shared vision is always a gift to each other. In these two early drawings, Pannoni connects vision to the growth of trees. The irises on the left are cross-sections of tree trunks. You've heard this by now lots, which show the sort of rings of growth. The eyes on the right expand out into tree branches, connecting sight to a tree branch's quest for light, for expansion, and for connection. It's a give and a take. And as we see now throughout Pannone's career, the tree is a perpetual presence, a link and a thread and a branch that carries us from the late 1960s to today. He creates massive, grandiose trees out of bronze and steel and aluminum. You can see them here and here and here. These are the Terme di Caracalla in Rome. He has created um, this work in um, a sculpture park in Belo Horizonte in Brazil. And you'll see one of the amazing things that he is doing now, even as he casts the tree in bronze, he will connect it with living trees so that the growth of the tree and the sculpture continues over time, over generations. It will always be a changing thing. He's had his work at Versailles, where he has this time an upside down tree, but out of the roots is planted another tree. So showing that cycle of life. He's exhibited at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park in England, where the tree is in the forest. Oftentimes he will add these big boulders or stones. Even though the tree is sort of a representation of a tree, the stone is a representation of gravity and how much the tree has to work to grow up and is um, sort of reacting to forces in the world. Um, you might have come across his work in Madison Square Park behind um, the Flatiron Building. Uh, there was another installation. And then here at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, outside in what was once the parking lot, he has a tree and then another tree growing above it. So two trees coming together. Um, so I'll conclude by talking about how these works are about exchange about materials, nature, and humankind, the necessity of growth, the responsibility of being still. Pannone's continued to share his vision of modeling a careful consideration of the natural world, its impact on us and our impact on it. Through his drawings, through his massive sculptures, his small gestures, he shows us that through the process of the natural world, we are always moving in tandem, and it is incumbent upon us to be cognizant of what we put out into the world and what we get back. So thank you very much. Yeah, I think that's, that was also very much the mood of the art world uh, in the moment in the late 60s and early 70s when Pannone was sort of coming into the art world and thinking about sort of what it is that he's doing. And especially in Italy at this time that had experienced this 
just incredible growth, like this in, insanely sort of radical post-war expansion. Um, the idea was, um, are we being responsible by sort of adding to this sort of westernization, right? Of like, let's just make things and sell them and sell them and sell them. Um, and I think a lot of the pop world too, I think Warhol and other people were responding to that and saying like, what are all, what's all this stuff that we're making? What's the point of it? That being said, Pinone buys entirely into the gallery system, into the world of the, the art world, and is represented by Marion Goodman Gallery and Gagosian Gallery, which are two of the top blue chip galleries. Um, I think when I talk about how artwork, especially from this early period, gets commodified, it was because so much of it was about process and sort of rejecting that world. That is not a way in which one can succeed as an artist because as to succeed one needs some kind of platform. And that means having a gallery, that means having exhibitions, that means sort of presenting yourself as someone who is value. So it's a, it's a really tricky thing and one of the things about the art world that it's really funky, right? And it's not really to monetize it. To commodify it is not the same thing as monetizing the yes. intellectual. Right. Product. Right, exactly. And it's also really not transparent. Like, who decides, right? Who decides what something is worth? And I think a lot of artists were rejecting that sort of um, way in which they weren't in control of that, and somebody else was. Um, but Pinone, after sort of the Arte Povera movement sort of mm, stopped in the mid-70s, he continued on his own and had a, has had and continues to have one of the most successful sculpture careers. And it's definitely selling work. Because everything is in major collections. Yes? Is he doing just trees now? No. I focused on this sort of one section. Um, but he makes work out of marble that is about um, sort of uh, bodily functions. He makes uh, incredible work that's about breath. Uh, that is also metal and uses leaves and clay. So trees are one main section of his work. But and yeah. is that a permanent exhibit in the Philip Museum? No, that was uh, on the occasion of the exhibition. So I think maybe there was hope that it would be acquired. I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't know the internal workings. Yeah. So I was really curious that you should be giving this presentation a year ago today yeah. that uh, Denise Walsh gave a talk about um, Jeff Koons. Oh, there you go. So there's a hyper, hyper commodification. Definitely on a different spectrum, although gallery-wise, they're, you know, but um, yeah, no, I mean, that sort of look at the objects that we are so familiar with that Jeff Koons does miraculous work with, you know, um, I think they are playing with the world in different ways, but showing us the, showing us and replicating the world. Just maybe not balloon dogs or clay or inflatables or all the other things that Jeff Koons does. Um, Pinoni's pivot towards nature. And I think the way that he also puts his work back in, like his things, his trees, uh, his sculptures that have that sense of longevity, that he'll like put them back out into the world and they're gonna be there. And so I think there is that sense of um, living beyond us. What is yeah. that? Because you can go and tell everything for trees. Yeah. They won't be there. I mean, think about how we scratch our yeah. names into them, yeah, and yeah. there's yeah. something, you and know. It's listening to you. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Yeah. That's really beautiful. Yeah. There um, were three videos um, that were part of 
the exhibition in Philadelphia in which he, uh, Pinone, shows himself um, talking to grass and talking to trees and saying, like, my breath is feeding the grass and my breath is feeding the tree. And that sense of reciprocalness, right, that the trees give to us and we give to the tree, so we're always giving part of ourselves over to some, another being um, is really a, a huge part of his work. Yeah, thanks for that. That's a lovely observation. So this, I, I wonder if I just kind of missed something or, so when he is taking that block or the tree, the existing tree, yeah. and then making, you know, in a s subsection of it, making another tree, mm -hmm. in a, is he actually following the rings of the tree? Yes, I'm sorry yes. that I have yeah. to go backwards. I'm trying to find an example so that we can look at it. So he's actually yeah. unearthing what is there. Yeah. He's not creating something new. No, so this is actually um, following, you'll see like the center of the tree mm -hmm. would be right there. And so when he picks the beam, he's looking for the marks so that he knows mm -hmm. that there are branches. So yeah, this isn't an imagined uh, mm -hmm. sapling. This is the sapling that is inside. These are the branches as he was able to recreate them. So yeah, it's, it's, it's actually a really creepy kind of thing to think about this, um, this tree living inside the wood and, and being there all along um, and being rediscovered. So yeah, and it's, I mean, he talks about it. It's like, oh yeah, I just carved these things. It's like, no, that's really hard. Like, how did you figure that out? Uh, yeah. Like Michelangelo, right? So this is exactly where you kind of connect me, um, Pinone back to the great Italian sculptor who would look at a block and the work was revealing what was already there in the block, right? He's looking at the, these, you know, and the, if you've been to the Accademia in Florence and you've walked the hallway to see David, they're all the prisoners and the slaves on either side. I wish I had, um, but they are bodies that are partly revealed, right? They're partly in, in the block and partly out. So it is an absolute direct and perfect comparison to think about the way in which uh, Michelangelo talked about revealing that really humanistic desire to reveal what was already there and what Pannone is doing with trees. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great.